Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on Introduction to Fiction Part 2, Resourceful, Resourceful Source Material. Uh, as I've mentioned before in these mini lectures on fiction, uh, this work is largely influenced by Thomas Foster's How to Read Literature Like a Professor, and I would also recommend his other book, How to Read Novels Like a Professor. Both of them are, are very useful in, in kind of getting a good grasp around literature. So we're going to talk about today some of the ways in which literature, or, or to better understand literature, you need to connect literature. Uh, you need to connect it with other stories and other things. And this is where it does pay to be an avid reader, but even if you're not an avid reader, to at least pay to have paid attention or to think about the various stories that you have been exposed to. Uh, in order to, if you, in doing that, it helps you better see the patterns that are in some of the literature that we'll be looking at here and in all storytelling as a whole. So the first is intertextuality, and I have here an image of a spider web, which I think is the best way is is the best way to talk about, it. and that's kind of how all stories are interconnected, and how we connect those or make sense of those is is really important. So with intertextuality, th one of the premises is that stories are not written in a vacuum, and what I mean by that is by the time an author sits to write a story he or she has been influenced by thousands of stories throughout their lives. The stories they grew up, right? The fairy tales that they listened to, the stories their parents told them, the stories they read, the stories they watched, the stories they heard. All of those stories influence the writer. All of those stories influence the choices. And sometimes, directly, the author draws upon those stories to help tell another story. In this, one way to think of this is that borrowing in storytelling is necessary. In order for us to make sense of one story, we've had to have been exposed to other stories. Otherwise, it doesn't necessarily add up. Um, that borrowing is a key piece, right? Lit culture is about borrowing, right? We growing up, as we embody and move into culture, we borrow from the culture of the past. Language. Right? In order for us to have our own culture of today, we have to use the language of yesterday. And so with intertextuality, that's very much the case, is that they, they, there's a lot of borrowing that goes on. It's not stealing, it's not inappropriately, you know, trying to, well, sometimes it is stealing when it's, you know, when somebody has taken somebody else's work and not given credit or, or not clearly distinguish it as its own, but you know, there is a lot of borrowing that goes on, and that makes sense because, of course, there's a lot of things that happen in history, in our lives, in the world, that we all want to write about and try to give our own take on, um, as well as reconsider other people's takes. And connecting these stories together, understanding how one text is connected to another is connected to another, it produces a deeper meaning and deeper connection to that piece of work. It says, you know, here are the ways in which this this text can be rendered important and interesting and useful. Um, it makes it something more than just a single moment, a single story. In one of the, uh, you know, I, I'll say it's fun, um, one of the things I like about this is that it can be fun in that you can treat all all fiction as kind of a mystery and a guessing game of well how does this connect with other stories or what what is this connected to where have I seen this before and there is power in that there is usefulness in that there is intrigue in that one of the most curious connections that I've seen happen uh, if you is to is for you to watch the Beowulf film, the 2007 CGI film, and to see the parallels in that Beowulf film with Star Wars, and it, it, it there is some parallels that happen there that are worth mentioning. Kind of how father and son are pitted against each other, and even the loss of an arm, and um, yeah, th there's some fascinating things within that. All right, so. 
we talked here about intertextuality, kind of how stories connect. And what I want to look at now is what are some popular sources that authors borrow from, that authors look to for inspiration. Well, Shakespeare is the big one. Um, lots of people build from Shakespeare because, of course, it's Shakespeare. the the the, war, the text of the 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 plays of Shakespeare are very profound and useful and relevant, and they tackle all sorts of elements of identity and in culture and challenges um, amidst people. And so, some good examples of that are uh, Sons of Anarchy and Breaking Bad. Right, so these are TV examples, and I'm using, you know, examples that are from the popular culture today, so that you can better understand that these aren't just this doesn't just happen in literature. This happens everywhere. So Sons of Anarchy, as I've mentioned elsewhere, is a modern day Hamlet. Right, the main character is trying to reconcile the fact that, you know, his uncle is now betting his mother, and his father was killed somewhere along the way, and the f the uncle had something to do with it. Breaking Bad is fascinating, and what I would encourage people to take a look at is Breaking Bad as, in some ways, a modern rendering of Shakespeare's play Macbeth, where you there are certainly significant differences, but the overall theme of the wife kind of encouraging or, or demanding that the husband make more money um, in the paths, you know, to that the husband be more successful in the paths that the husband takes um, that prove the undoing of the entire family. Uh, I think there's some very strong Macbeth influences when you look at Shakespeare. The Bible, of course, is huge. It is just, the, you know, the, the influence, how many different works directly or indirectly invoke the Bible is, you know, just as much as Shakespeare. And so you're continually looking at works that make any reference to the Bible or enacting scenes from the Bible are worth recognizing and understanding that point because it gives you a better sense of where the story is going. So one of the reasons why the Bible is so often referred to is like Shakespeare, it's, it's, major, it's a majorly read work. Uh, you know, for much of the the history of, of popular literacy, the Bible was one of the few books, you know, particularly during the 17 and 18, and even some of the 1900s, the Bible was one of the few works that almost everybody had, uh, that they could go to, that they could read. You would have a family Bible, and in that family Bible you would also, you know, you would have your family tree. And so Bibles would be passed down intergenerationally. I don't know of any book that has been passed down like that. So it's a majorly read work, it's accessible, people have read it, and, and in reading so much of it, and it having so many different stories in it, many have built upon it, many have taken from it, directly or indirectly. Uh, it's also, you want to look for naming conventions, right? If you have characters named John or Peter, you might want to ask, you know, what that's all about. Adam, Eve, right? You want to be aware that the naming conventions, even if you go into Shakespeare, I mean, obviously somebody, somebody named Hamlet, that's going to raise, you know, that's going to be a question. Somebody named Romeo, you're going to be wondering why. Even somebody named Catherine from Taming of the Shrew should give you some insight, or you might want to be thinking about the naming conventions, whether they're biblical or Shakespeare in nature. So there's also certain story conventions. Um, there's Eden as a as a place, right? Anywhere that's considered perfect, that's considered ideal, is considered Eden. And so if you have any story where people are in a perfect place and then they are kicked out, they are meant to fled, they are, you know, chased out of, or they violate Eden and, and are, are sent elsewhere. You have David and Goliath stories where, you know, a, a this is what we call the underdog story, right? Where the, the, the less powerful or the perceptively less powerful person has to go against the giant. Um, and we see this in a lot of stories. In fact, the rags to riches story, uh, made famous by Horatio Alger, and, and seen throughout, where you know the the young underdog, typically boy, has to fight his way up to become successful, has elements of David and Goliath in that, because there's usually somebody the boy has to face off against, and defeat or one up or whatever. The story of Job, you know, story. This is one in where your main character faces devastating, overwhelming, you know, extremely horrific events, 
as a test, as a test and a testament to his faith or to his belief in whatever it is that he's pursuing. And then, of course, we have lots of literature that uh, invokes the apocalypse, whether it's the zombie apocalypse or otherwise. But all of these are story conventions that find their, you know, their original inspiration from the Bible. There's there's lots. I mean, I I could, they do entire courses on the Bible as literature, just reading the Bible not as a religious text but as a literary source in all the different ways in which it inspires literature. So here are a couple others, but. You're aware of many more, and I would keep an eye out for that. Orphans, right? There's there's lots of, um, I mean, people have made comparisons between, say, Harry Potter and the story of Moses. They're both, you know, spe- chosen ones who are sent to live with families in which they are a second-class citizen. So there's lots of these, and, and the importance is to be aware of them. Fairy, ta- fairy and folk tales, right? So, you know, your Little Red Riding Hood, your Hansel and Gretel, your three little pigs. Uh, these also, you want to be aware of these as you start to read other, you know, as you start to read fiction and how they might influence or have influenced or be used in what you're reading. So one one example I like is, uh, you know, if we look at Peter Pan and Adam Sandler movies. I don't necessarily know about the Adam Sandler movies of the last, say, five to ten years, but a lot of the movies that Adam Sandler made, particularly in the 90s and early 2000s, I, they are what I would call uh, Peter Pan films, in that the character that Adam Sandler is playing is essentially a child. He's an adult child, but he's still a child. And he goes through his life as a child. And what happens within the story is that he's being challenged by that being an eternal eternal child, right? Like Peter Pan. Peter Pan is always a... It, it doesn't want to grow up. And so within Adam Sandler movies, it's typically he's this Peter Pan character. He goes through some kind of trial tribulation, and he grows up just enough to be accepted by the other people in his world, but can still be that child that, you know, we all know and love. So that, you know, in some ways, that that's very much like Peter Pan. Um... And I would say that, you know, that there seems to be a inspiration in Adam Sandler movies to aspire to Peter Pan. We also have mythology. Um, one of the best examples for me about mythology and, and connecting sources is when I was growing up, well, well before I ever read, you know, myth- mythology and the famous, you know, Greek epics and all of that. I used to watch DuckTales, and people that don't know what DuckTales is, it was a cu- it was a cartoon, you know, an, a weekly afternoon cartoon in the late 80s and 90s, and it followed Scrooge McDuck and his three nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, um, from the, you know, the, the, the Disney characters, and they did this two or three part episode that was the Odyssey. Now, I didn't know it was the Odyssey. I didn't know it was Homer's The Odyssey. I just thought it was this interesting, fascinating, Greek, you know, great story. But it wasn't until years later, when I was in high school, and I was reading The Odyssey in my literature course, that I realized, oh, I know this story. I watched it on DuckTales, like, five years ago. So this is where it, it becomes interesting, and you connect things. You, you look at a story, and you no longer see it the same. Like, I no longer saw that DuckTales as, oh, it's just, you know, they decided to time travel and go back to ancient Greece. whoop de doo It was, oh, they were trying to tell me the story of the Odyssey. And because I learned about it from there, when I was reading the Odyssey in my class, it made it that much easier to make sense of and enhance the meaning of both. So when we're looking at mythology, you know, that there's tying back to ancient epics. Two of the big ones in Western culture, of course, are the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, more so the Odyssey. It's, it's considered Homer's more successful work, and people draw upon that, you know, that journey, um, that 20-year journey and the different crazy things that happen. Uh, but certainly any kind of ancient epic, Beowulf. Um, some people refer to Dante Alighieri's uh, Divine Comedy as... A epic, uh, so you know, all, all the way up to Paradise Lost as an epic. So these are texts that, you know, are drawn upon in order to enhance the story. Plays a lot, and, and we can thank Sigmund Freud for this. But there's lots of reliance on um, using the mythology of plays, and particularly, of course, uh, Oedipus Rex or the Oedipus trilogy. By let's see, that one was. 
Euripides, uh, or Sophocles, I always forget, but, you know, we, we see this, you know, the, these ancient plays that a lot of authors use as inspiration for modern tales. And also places. Uh, there's a lot of mythological places, whether that's the underworld, right, that we see from from Greek mythology, uh, whether that is Midgar, uh, which we can see from Norse mythology, or, you know, the, these places that don't exist. Um, the Aleutian fields, the, the, yeah, the, the, Elys the Elysian fields um, in Greek mythology, all these places that, you know, are not real, but characters aspire to. Uh, we see that, ha you know, we see characters looking for these places or places like these. Oracles, you often see a character going to some kind of truth sayer, some kind of oracle, whether they're real or not, and they're drawing upon this ancient mythology. So other places, as I said, the underworld, the labyrinth, right? So a character gets goes into this labyrinth, this maze of some sort, in which they also have to confront some being, typically, that looks like or acts like in some way the Minotaur. All right, so hopefully this gives you some idea of source material to look at and the ways in which texts interrelate uh, and can connect and enhance meeting. All right, thank you very much for listening. I will see you in the next video.